welcome to Etz Chaim, which means the Tree of Life. We're a messianic congregation that understands that Jesus is Yeshua, our Messiah, and He wants us to follow the Torah just as He did. And now, with a weekly Torah reading, Rabbi Mordecai Silver. Shabbat Shalom. This week's portion is the Echanan, and it means I and I pleaded. Deuteronomy 3, 23 through 7, 11. A Torah portion is Isaiah 41 through 26, and the Apostolic Scripture portion is 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. The introduction. Moses continues his final address to Israel. When you think of the core teachings of the Torah, Certain essentials quickly come to mind. The liberation from Egypt, the Shema, declaring the uniqueness of God, the Ten Words, affirming a moral and sacred order to human existence, and the teachings and instructions we find in the Torah, which brings us to understand we have fallen short of the mark, but to help us reach the end of the Messiah of Israel, showing us the love relationship between God and His people. Deuteronomy 3, 23-28 And I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Please let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country and Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, Enough from you. Do not speak to me of this matter again. Go up to the top of Pisgah and look up and lift your eyes up westward and northward and southward and eastward and look at it with your eyes. For you shall not go over this Jordan, but charge Joshua and encourage and strengthen him. For he shall go over at the head of his people and he shall put them in possession of the land that you shall see. So apparently this was Moses' last ditch effort to get God to change his mind and let him go into the land. And this is Moses' 40th year of leading Israel. And after 40 years of leading Israel and serving God, he makes the statement, O oh Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. Now sometimes I wonder if that was totally the truth or whether he was just trying to smooth the way in to get figuring that he could, you know, pat God on God on the back and say, What a great job you're doing and everything, and there's so much more that you can teach me. And I'm sure that there probably was. But forty years of having that relationship that he did with the Lord. I think by then he would have known better. But then there's a last dig that he gets in there in 26. Not with God. But the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. His last dig at trying to blame Israel for him not being able to go into the land. You notice he doesn't say that he's the one that lost his temper and struck the rock twice even though God told him not to. He's saying, it's because of you guys that I can't get into the land. He says, you did this to me. And, you know, it's basically true to a point, but Moses knew that God held leaders to a higher level. And he was held probably to the highest level of accountability of any leader that ever led the children of Israel. Or serve God. Because it was because of Moses that they were able to receive the Torah from God. To receive this covenant and be called out to be a special people unto the Lord. It was between Moses and God that he was able to bring this understanding. And it's also, he showed the relationship between God and the children of Israel tried to teach them that God had a special plan for them. The thing was is that over all these centuries and millennia, we've forgotten that 
you know, we kind of look at Israel as, okay, Israel is just the Jewish people. But that's not the way the Bible describes Israel. Israel was formerly formed from the 12 tribes of Israel based on the 12 sons of Jacob. But even from the very beginning, they took into Israel those who were not born into Israel. They were allowed to come in and they were able to become part of Israel. Caleb is one of them. Because when we see Caleb's distinctions in there and they describe Caleb, they call him a Kinesiite. Now, was he a Kinesiite directly and then he was grafted into Israel? Or was it his father or his grandfather, whatever? But there has to be a reason for that, but yet Caleb is identified with the tribe of Judah. So what it's showing us is that you do not have to be born into Israel, that you can be brought into Israel, you can be grafted in, and you can be adopted. It's not strictly just this one group of people that's unique just to Israel. It's Israel that you need. Israel, according to the Bible, Israel, according to the nation that now is in the land, but only part of it. Because they don't represent the fullness of all of Israel. They only represent part of Israel. Moses had to contend with all of Israel. And we know the stories over the 40 years. We know the rebellion on the part of the Israelites. We know that God condemned one entire generation, aged 20 years and up, to die in the wilderness. And I've actually read some rabbinic commentary about it that the rabbis say that it was only the men that died. That the women didn't die. The women weren't at fault. I don't believe so because it was identified as a generation. It was identified as all those people 20 years of age and up that were condemned to that. They were not allowed to go into the land. And here we have, right at this point in time, the last one of that generation, Moses, who's not allowed to go into the land. But he receives kind of a slight reprieve and a blessing where the Lord is going to allow him to be able to go up on a mountain and be able to take in all the expanse of the land, the promised land that he had given to Israel. But he told him, you will not go over. You will not go in. I've read some rabbinic commentaries where they said that Moses did go in. He snuck it. And I went, that's really a good one. Do you really think that Moses is going to defy God like that? You know, I really don't think so. Some people would say, well, why wouldn't he? What could God do to him? Kill him? He was going to kill him anyway. Moses is going to die. But God can do more than that to you. It's not just a physical death that you could suffer. You could suffer a spiritual death. And in that spiritual death, you would be totally removed and separated from God forever. There would be no opportunity for you to be able to come into the kingdom. To be able to go into the land. To be able to keep that covenant that God made with himself and with his people. So that would be the part where I do not believe that Moses would do that. Moses never defied God. But what it shows us is, is that Moses did try to change God's mind. I would think that, I guess maybe he thought because throughout the, his history of 40 years with Israel and all the things that Israel had done and God had punished them and he had interceded on their behalf and God relented of his punishment of Israel time and time again that maybe this one time God would also relent for his sake. But God wouldn't do it. And because God wouldn't do that, I just love verse 26. But the Lord was angry with me because of you. He passed the buck. I think, I would like to think better of Moses. But he's trying to pass the responsibility. It's almost like when you look at Adam and Hava in the garden. It wasn't just Hava's fault. It was Adam's fault. 
Why was it Adam's fault? Because we're told Adam was there when the conversation between the serpent and between Hava took place. And he didn't say a word. He was totally quiet. He knew what God's command was. Because he's the one that related it to Hava. He told her what God had said. And they tell you that Adam actually added on a little bit to that. He kind of expanded on that command with Hava. But the end result was is still... When God confronts them for what they did, Adam passes the buck to Hava, and Hava passes the buck to the serpent. The buck stopped there, and the serpent was cursed. But so was Hava, and so was Adam, because they didn't own up to what they had done. It's the same thing. It's with Moses, it's the same thing. He doesn't own up to what he did. He's not accepting the responsibility for it. And maybe it's because all these years that he's leading Israel, he thought finally he reached the shores of the promised land. He was right there. And here was the promise about to be fulfilled and he could go in at the head of the children of Israel and lead them into the promised land. And God says, oops, you're done. You did your job. It's as far as you go. I'm sorry, but because of what you did, you may not go over. And it's very sad. And an entire generation wasn't permitted to go over either. The only two out of that generation that we know is Joshua and Caleb. That was it. And that punishment was due to the 12 spies. Only two, Caleb and Joshua, brought back the good report and said as long as they have faith in God, they can overcome any obstacle that they will face when they go into the land. And out of that, we should understand that any obstacle that we may face, God will help us to overcome. Amen. And it may not be in, in the way that we think that it's supposed to be done. You know, we want a miracle to happen. And everybody says, as long as you have a good relationship with God, and you're doing all these things, and you love God, and you do these different things, and you ask for something from God, God will do it for you. I don't know what Bible they're reading, but they're not reading the same Bible that I am. Because the Bible that I'm reading in there doesn't say that God is going to give you everything that you want or everything that you ask for. He will give you what you need. He doesn't always give you what you desire. And a lot of us, what we desire is to hit the lottery. <laughs> but the odds against that now that would be a real miracle and plus you have to buy a lottery ticket so you know you got to trust in God that no matter what no matter what you face God is going to see you through that he saw Israel through he brought them to the bank right there at the Jordan River ready to cross over into the promised land and he would give them the land as much as they could take. They didn't take all of it. They didn't take everything that God had promised to them because God told them wherever the sole of your foot stepped, that was yours. And they didn't do all of it. What happened? The reason they didn't do all of it was because Joshua got too old to could no longer lead the Israelites. And there really wasn't any appointed leader after him. It fell to the elders. And after the elders, it fell to the judges. So they were stuck. They really didn't go forward because apparently they just didn't have a leader on the same scale as Moses and Joshua. And then when they come into the kings, that's another problem. Because we had good kings and we had bad kings. We had kings that would do what God wanted and kings that wouldn't. So every time a king wouldn't do what God wanted, that was a step backwards for them. So then you have to take one step forward and two steps back. And it's a back and forth situation for that. Until they come to the exile and the dispersion from the land. And it didn't just happen one time. They were exiled and dispersed several times from the land. In Isaiah 40, verses 10 and 11, Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and His arm rules for Him. 
Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So, here we're told by the prophet Isaiah that the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. How can God's arm rule for him? How can he do that? It's kind of a unique meaning that's there. What struck me, what struck me immediately when I read that is, he's talking about Messiah. Because Messiah is the arm of the Lord. Messiah is the one that rules for him and will rule for him during the Messianic Kingdom. After the Messianic Kingdom, we're told that the Father and the Son will sit on the throne. And the Father will rule through His Son more than likely because that's the promise He made to Messiah. And God keeps His Word. And Yeshua, He's described as being a shepherd. A lot of those in Israel have described that Moses was a shepherd before he became the leader of Israel. David was a shepherd before he became the king of Israel. Why is that important? Shepherds spend a lot of time by themselves. They spend a lot of time. And they're out there in all kinds of weather and everything. And their responsibility is to make sure they don't lose any of the lambs in the, in the flock. They have to be careful for all of them. They have to go after that one that runs away and brings that one back. They have to maintain the entire flock. And it's interesting how they describe that. And how they use that. That he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. You always need a lead lamb. Always. Because the flock will follow the leader. Literally. They follow the leader. And they go in and wherever the leader goes, they go. And how did they keep them at night? Well, when they needed to keep them at night, they didn't let them roam out there free. A lot of people misunderstand that. They built a temporary enclosure where they could keep all the flock in in one spot all night without having to worry about them. And they also had nice doggies that would help them. I don't know whether they had them back then, but I would think that they did because... A lot of these things that people do today with raising cattle and raising sheep and things like that, it's ancient. It's not something new. It's something that's been going on for a very, very long time. Farming and everything like that. They weren't making cell phones 3,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. <laughs> not unless we believe that aliens came down and gave the, uh, the Egyptians this technology and things like that as they do. What was that? They wouldn't. they wouldn't. I mean, maybe they gave them the technology to build nuclear bombs and all this other stuff and everything that we have today, but I doubt that also. You know? I mean, come on. These are people that, instead of having paper to write notes on, they wrote on rocks and everything else. And it's kind of telling us how Israel, remember what Joshua did before they entered into the land? Blessings on one rock and curses on another. It was kind of a warning. If you come into the land of Israel, guess what? Here are our rules. And you break them. This set says you're, this is what the curses are and this says what the blessings are. So, you couldn't claim ignorant in Israel. He just couldn't. And it's kind of indicative of today we claim ignorance for everything. You know, we don't know this. We don't understand that. We're not going to do this. We don't want to do that. This is that, that, that. Blah, 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 blah. And we always try to figure out a way to get around it. And that's not just the law of man. We've taken the law of God and we've just totally trashed it. We've taken it, we've thrown it in the can, and we've stomped on it, and then kind of put it underneath one of those, you know, uh, crushers and everything else, until we can't even recognize what it is anymore. And then we scratch our heads when we become interested in it, trying to figure out, what has it got to say? Well, 
You're not going to find anybody in the church that wrote about what commands you're supposed to follow and how you're supposed to follow them. But then when you come over to the Jewish side of it and they list all the commandments that they say that are in the Torah and you read some of the things that they have in there, some of them don't have a clue either as to what you're supposed to do. And they kind of make it up on the fly. And so what do you do with that? Does it mean because you can't do one thing that you don't try to do the others? No, you do the best that you can with what you understand. And if you don't understand it, you just don't throw it out. You just set it aside until you do. Eventually, we'll understand exactly what God expects from us. Because we're told that the day is coming when we won't need a Bible anymore. We won't need to worry about or think about what we're supposed to do. It will literally be the light bulb will finally be turned on and we will know exactly what God expects from us. And it will become just like the air that we breathe that will follow Him. In Micah 5, 4, And He shall stand and shepherd His flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord His God. And they shall dwell secure, for now He shall be great to the end of the earth. Once again, they use a shepherd and they use that to show us that the shepherd will rule in the strength of the Lord. He will stand and he will shepherd the flock. Who are the flock? Israel. And I'm not just talking about the state of Israel that's over there. I'm talking about the biblical Israel that God brings together. Of all people who believe in him, believe in Messiah Yeshua, and believe in following his covenant of Torah. And when you understand that, you'll finally catch on to what God expects from us. It's not about trying to figure out how to get out of what God wants you to do. It's about doing what God wants you to do. In John 10, 11 it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, 14 and through 16. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is Messiah speaking. You notice what he says here, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Messiah is talking to Israel at this point in time. And he is talking about that he has other sheep that are not of the flock of Israel. So who is he talking about? The sheep of the nations. There are sheep in the nations and they can come into Israel. And he says, he must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. And he says, there will be one flock and one shepherd. So is it a flock of the Jewish people? And is it a flock of the church? Or is it the one flock of Israel? I'll accept the teaching that it's the one flock of Israel that he's speaking about. And not these other groups who want to contend with one another over who is Israel. Israel who's, is who God says it is. And he gives us every indication throughout Scripture that everyone who believes in Messiah and follows Torah are the ones who are his people. So people are going to say, well, what about the good people out there? You know, there's really good people that are out there. I know there are good people that are out there. And I'm not the, glad I'm not the one that judges. It's up to God to decide who is in and who is out. We have enough to worry about with ourselves without worrying about others. Even though I know all of us that are parents worry about our children. And we're concerned all about that. Well, all we can do is turn them over to God and just keep praying for them. And what you pray for is, God, give them a kick in the backside. <laughs> and wake them up so they see the reality and the truth of what God wants and not what the world wants. 
So it's an ongoing process. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, it says, Therefore, to keep me from becoming overly proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from the adversary to pound away at me, so that I wouldn't grow conceited. Three times I begged the Lord to take this thing away from me. But he told me, My grace is enough for you, for my power is brought to perfection and weakness. Therefore, I am very happy to boast about my weaknesses, in order that the Messiah's power will rest upon me. It's interesting. This is the Apostle Paul that's speaking here. Or in Hebrew, he's called Shaul. And instead of Apostle, the Hebrew word would be Shaliach. And Apostle and Shaliach both mean the same thing. They mean a messenger. So while we want to put a exalted state in the word Apostle, all it is is a messenger. It's a sent out one from God. It's one that God chooses to go out and give his message. So everybody that wants to run around today and tell you that, well, I'm an apostle this and I'm this and I'm, I knew a guy one time, he called himself a rabbi, a brother, an apostle. A he had every title underneath the book in there. And I think, I said, well, you trying to cover every angle and everything that's in there? You're not happy? You know, with all the, well, God called me to all these things. I said, that's even more than the fivefold ministry that the church talks about. And he just didn't get it. He didn't understand. What's in a title? A title is what you use more so. You're not impressing God. You're there to use it because you're trying to, at least for me, it's my what I have to do to relate between myself and the secular world. And then taking care of things that I have to do there. We've got to be careful with what we call people, how we address people, how we lift people up. It's not about the individual. It's about them being a messenger. Now Paul, in this passage of Scripture, he's talking about a thorn in his flesh. And he says a messenger from the adversary. So he's saying a demon who serves Satan is the one that put this thorn in my flesh and he pounds away at me so that I wouldn't grow conceited. And he says, three times I begged the Lord to take this thing from me. But he told me, my grace is enough for you, for my power is brought to perfection and weakness. So Paul flipped it. And he says, therefore, I am very happy to boast about my weaknesses. So instead of wanting to boast about how great an apostle I am, he reversed that and he said, I am great because I am weak. But in my weaknesses, you'll see Messiah, the one that I serve. And it's not the first time that Paul contends with other people who are in ministry that he goes to them and he talks about, you know, well, you follow this one and you're following that one and you say you follow me and you do it. It's not about us. It's about the one that we are all supposed to be following. It's Messiah first and everyone after. And anyone who believes that they're called to leadership should understand that in leadership you're not just leading, you are called to serve. And we serve the body of Messiah. And knowing the story of Moses the way that I do, I can tell you I will never last 40 years. It ain't going to work. There's no way. God can take me anytime He wants. But I, my wife said I have to stay until she dies first. She made me promise. I had to promise her. And she holds me to that. And I said, what are you going to do to me if I die first? You know? You know? But if I know she's going to find a way to get, get me, she will. She'll find a way. That's not nice. Well, you're mean to me. Mm -hmm. It's going to take away that little thing they gave you that said, you're the nice one. But you know, the reality is, is that God's in control. And it's interesting because people, when you read this passage of Scripture, I have heard over the years people saying about this thorn in the flesh. Now he says it's a thorn in his flesh. But I've heard people say, no, it's a spiritual thorn. 
and God did this and God did that and blah 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 and he did this and I, what word is to tell you that well that's that's what I believe and that's what I see I said that's all fine but you can't prove it he said it's something physical now some people have speculated it was a, possibly a problem with his eyes and the reason they say that is because initially remember he was blinded by God's presence by Messiah appearing before him and he was blinded until his hands were laid on him and this blindness fell away from him like scale and some believe that po possibly that this problem was with him because they, they even tell you that a lot of the, uh, the, the uh, apostles or disciples and whatever didn't write their own messages. They had scribes who they dictated them to and they wrote down their messages for them. And in Paul's case, you see him refer to different scribes in some of his letters. And he commends them because they are writing down what he's doing. So, was the possibility that something was wrong with his eyes? Possibly, but we don't know. We don't know what the thorn in his flesh was. But he asked God three times to take it away from him, and God said no. He says, because it would be in your weakness that people will be able to see me. It's the same thing with Moses. Moses says, I want to go into the land. Please let me go in. And God said, enough, no. There is a time when God tells you enough is enough. Don't bring it up again. Let it go. And we have to learn to listen for when God says no. None of us really want to think about that. We all want to wait until God says yes. And we will keep harping on the same thing over and over and over again. But maybe, just maybe, if we take the time to listen... Maybe we'll hear it when God says no. And Ezekiel 28, 24. And for the house of Israel there shall be no more a briar to prick or a thorn to hurt them among all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I am the Lord God. So the day is coming, according to the prophet, when nothing will no longer hurt Israel. And everyone who's treated them with contempt, they will come to understand through Israel who the Lord God is. In Job 2, starting in verse 3, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your faith. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out in the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loads and swords, with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. It's interesting when you read that. But what can we learn from that passage of Scripture? That God allows Satan and uses Satan to test us. Satan is an instrument of God. And more than likely, since he rebelled against God from the very beginning that he was created for that purpose, to be used by God as an instrument to test us. And that Satan would become so full of himself that that's what caused him to be knocked down. That he wound up saying, look how great I am. Look how wonderful I am. I should be God. And when man believes that he can be God, who created everything that there is, including them, then he has a problem. And a lot of people today have God complexes. And instead of looking to the one who has blessed them, they look to themselves. And that's not right. But the day is coming 
when God will set everything right. But you know, we have to keep in mind that Satan serves God. And I don't believe that there's anything that Satan does that he does on his own without the permission of the one that created him. Because God knows everything. You can't hide anything from him. And I don't believe that Satan can hide anything from him. Because if it wasn't so, Satan could have hided everything that he has planned in order to what he wants to do, and yet God spells it all out for us in this Bible. He shows us in Scripture what Satan's going to do. And maybe it's because God set Satan up to do these things. That Satan isn't doing this through his own will. He's doing it because God, maybe he believes that he's doing it on his own will and his own power. But really, it's God who's allowing him to do it. Because God can stop him anytime he wants to. God can stop him from doing what he's predicting or what he's saying is going to happen in Scripture. Because everything to God is not a prediction. Everything to God is fact. It's something that will happen. And the only reason that it hasn't happened yet is because we live in one plane of existence and God lives in another. God sees everything that has taken place from the very beginning to the very end. But we don't see the whole picture. Because we don't have the real big screen TV. And I'm going to close with this. Torah man says, how seldom we weigh our neighbor in the same balance with ourselves.